Many of you already know Judge Michael Brennan of the Seventh Circuit. He was a Wisconsin appellate court judge for nearly a decade before taking the federal bench. Before that, he spent years in private practice. He's also served as assistant DA, so he brings that perspective as well. But that's all in his bio. What you don't know or what you might not know about Judge Brennan is that he met his wife, Emily, through the Federalist Society. Indeed, Emily, who's on the premises today but not in the room, uh, was long ago a fellow staff member of mine at the Federalist Society uh, when Emily and Judge Brennan met. So my ultimate conclusion then is that we are the Federal Society that is much better as a matchmaking making dating service than we are uh, <laughs> assembling covert meetings. So Judge Brennan. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. For those of you wondering, that picture is still in Dean's office. <laughs> Our topic today is corporate and academic management. Uh, the title of this showcase could bring to mind issues that you see in the general media, the legal media, and otherwise on a monthly or weekly basis. In the academy, an invitation to a speaker, to a university or to a law school, has caused controversy. How has that school responded? How has the individuals who invited that speaker, how have they responded? Law school chapters of this society have hosted events at which protests have been staged. How do the law school, the chapter, how do they handle those circumstances? Uh, staying with the university model, how does a university investigate and adjudicate sexual assault or sexual discrimination on campus? How does that implicate Title IX and the various versions of Title IX within the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education? Um, they've taken on changing role over the decades. Um, so what are the standards of evidence that apply for sexual violence and what should due process requirements be in the campus context? In addition to discussion about the university environment, it's important to talk about the uh, management in the corporate world. A community organizing group, um, other non-shareholders, uh, might have challenged a corporation, for example, to divest themselves of certain assets or to leave a certain business space. This debate has been characterized as stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism. What obligations does a corporation have to non-shareholders to act in a certain manner? And how does that debate apply not just in the for-profit context, but in the not-for-profit context. Our distinguished speakers today will include individuals who've dealt directly with these issues, both in an academic way, but also in an actual practical way of um, dealing with the problems face-to-face. Uh, -face. Dean David Chizer is Dean Emeritus and Harvey R. Miller Professor of Law and Economics at Columbia Law School. He served as dean from 2004 to 2014. At 35, the dean was the youngest in school, the law school's history and the longest serving dean since 1971. While on a three-year leave from the law school from 2017 to 2019, Dean Schizer served as executive vice president and CEO of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, a century-old international humanitarian organization. He is a scholar of tax law and the nonprofit sector. He has served as a visiting professor at Yale, Harvard, and Georgetown. He's also taught at Tokyo University, Hebrew University, and other academic institutions. Before joining the law school faculty in 1998, the dean was a law clerk for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the US Supreme Court, and Judge Alex Kaczynski on the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He began his career in the tax department of the Davis Polk Law Firm. Lee Burdett Williams has worked in higher education and student affairs for more than three decades and is now the executive director of the College Autism Network, a nonprofit organization supporting the efforts of autistic college students in the institutions that serve them. She served previously as the vice president for student affairs and dean of students at Wheaton College in Massachusetts and the dean of students at the University of Connecticut. Her professional interests include student mental health, academic partnerships, learning communities, and student culture. A particular interest is in the experience of autistic students in student conduct processes. She's written extensively on these and other topics and is a frequent speaker and presenter on contemporary issues in higher education. 
She's the author of two books and has taught at the Student Affairs Graduate Programs at the University of Vermont, the University of Connecticut, Appalachian State University, and the University of, College, University of Maryland College Park, uh, from where she received her PhD. Robin Fretwell Wilson is the director of the Institute of Government and Public Affairs and the Mildred Van Voorhees Jones Chair in Law at the University of Illinois College of Law, where she served as the Associate Dean for Public Engagement. A scholar in family law, bioethics, and law and religion, Professor Wilson has worked extensively on behalf of state and federal law reform efforts in each of these realms. Uh, she is the author of 13 books, her articles have appeared in numerous law reviews and peer-reviewed law journals, and her work has been featured in many major media outlets. In 2010, and again in 2016, Professor Wilson was ranked among the top 10 family law scholars in the United States for scholarly impact. She ranks among the top 10% of authors in all-time downloads from the Social Science Research Network. Professor Wilson's scholarship has been cited by the 5th, 7th, and 10th circuits, in numerous other state and federal courts, and she's presented her research around the world. Professor Wilson founded and co-directs the University of Illinois College of Law's Family Law and Policy Program, and co-directs its Epstein Health Law and Policy Program. Richard Bagger is a partner and executive director of Christie 55 Solutions, uh, a New Jersey-based consulting firm that provides strategic counsel to assist clients with business strategies and opportunities and with complex public policy and regulatory challenges at the state, federal, and international levels. Rich is also an adjunct faculty member at Rutgers University and a member of the board of directors of Tonix Pharmaceuticals. Before joining Christie 55 Solutions, Rich worked in the health sector for over 25 years, including as the senior most global corporate affairs executive for Pfizer and Celgene companies. I note that each of our speakers speak today here in their personal capacity, and as you know, as always, the Federal Society takes no particular legal or public policy positions. All opinions expressed are those of the speaker. A quick word on format. Our total uh, panel time is an hour and 45 minutes. Each of the individual speakers are going to proceed with um, some opening remarks, about eight to 10 minutes each, in the order that I've introduced them. That'll be followed by a roundtable discussion and then we'll have time for audience question and answer in the last 15 to 20 minutes. So we'll begin with our uh, initial remarks from the Dean, Dean Chisholm. Judge, thank you. It's really nice to be with all of you today, and I'm gonna help you answer a burning question which I'm sure you think about all the time. Do I want to be a law school dean? And Basically, I can tell you there are absolutely fantastic aspects of this job, but I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, I'm going to talk about those moments when you wake up in the morning and say, why in the world am I doing this? And specifically, I'm going to talk about two experiences that I had over the years, uh, two case studies. One is about a controversy about a student group. Another is about the right way to run a disciplinary proceeding. But before I do that, I'm just going to start with a couple of with four, actually, four general observations about nonprofit management and about academic management specifically. So first, um, one of the reasons why managing, whether it's a university or another nonprofit, why it's so hard is that success is hard to measure. You cannot use profitability. And so think about it. If someone is doing something that really doesn't make a lot of sense, maybe they're just mistaken, maybe it's something that's good for them but not good for the organization. If that happens at a for-profit company, at least you can point out and say, hey, but, but what are the earnings like for your group, right? And if the earnings are bad, at the end of the day, they can't really explain it away. But at a nonprofit, it's not that simple. You still have to define what your mission is, you try to measure success, but you don't have that consensus around uh, what success looks like and it allows people to do things that in my opinion, they, they shouldn't be able to do. Which brings me to my second point, so what do we do about that? I'm in the middle of writing a book now on nonprofit management. It's called Run It Like a Business, What's Wrong with Nonprofits and How to Fix Them. And my basic point is, run it like a successful business. Don't do what's politically expedient. Don't do what's easy. Be rigorous in figuring out what the best course is to advance your mission and do that. But you also have to bring other people along. So if you remember nothing else, remember analysis and advocacy. To me, that's sort of the formula. Which brings us to part three 
uh, my third point. Um, academic management is in ways even harder because you have so little power. Um, think about it. One of the key groups that you're managing, tenured faculty, they don't have to listen to you, so a lot of it is about persuasion. I have a friend who is a law school dean who said that he dreams someday of being reincarnated as a manager with real power. Um, and the fourth point that I would make is that um, universities are fascinating ecologies with lots of different groups, different interests, and I think when you look at it from the outside, you might not recognize that. Uh, indeed, people in this room probably see an undifferentiated mass of left-wing sentiment, uh, and it's not altogether untrue, uh, but at the same time, uh, we have to distinguish among different groups. So let me start with students. One thing that is critically important about students and a reason why they sometimes see things differently than faculty is, it won't surprise you, they're young. Um, I remember how much smarter I must have been when I was young because I was certain about everything. Um, and that dynamic exists, and uh, I remember as a college student speaking to someone who was talking to me in a heartfelt way about what he believed, and then he pounded the table, and he said, the only thing I can't stand is intolerance. <laughs> no sense of irony at all in saying it. So you have the students on one side, then you have faculty. Um, as a conservative member of a law faculty, I can tell you that I'm not the norm. Uh, generally, they do point left. At the same time, they have other commitments that they really care about academic freedom and also uh, due process in a law school, both of those things are important in the, uh, in the discussion that we're about to have. So let me turn then uh, to those two anecdotes which illustrate these themes. Um, it's Friday afternoon, I'm already home, my cell phone rings, and a student, and this is September of 2005, it's my second year as, as a dean. And the student at the other end of the phone says, listen, I just wanted you to know that tomorrow uh, the student senate is likely to kick the Christian law students organization off campus. I thought you'd want to know. <laughs> uh, okay, so you, now you understand how I felt. Um, what happened there? Okay, so what happened was um, the, the student government, the student senate at Columbia Law School has a policy that a student organization has to be open to every, every student or if they aren't, then they're not eligible to be recognized. And the, the Christian Legal Society had changed its policy that fall, and they had decided to ask their members to make an affirmation of faith, and their leaders had to sort of affirm about conduct, and one of the principles that they included was that you could not be gay and also be a leader of this organization. So that's the, that's the fact pattern that created this issue. Some of you may know that a similar thing happened at Hastings, and five years later, the Supreme Court addressed the issue. Um, but what happened at Columbia? Well, one of the things that was particularly challenging is that this really was a decision the student senate could make and that I couldn't make for them as much as I would have liked to. Um, by contract, our tuition revenue, some of it goes directly to the student senate, they allocate it, and that's what this process was. And the truth is, if I said, this is what you have to do, I was really taking a risk that they would do the opposite, just to make the point that I couldn't tell them what to do. But I did not want the Christian Legal Society to be kicked off campus. At the same time, I did not want our LGBTQ students to feel as if the school was not uh, committed to them also. And so what do you do? Well, the real problem here is that we had an incredibly difficult issue, but the students on each side thought of it as easy. And that's what I had to fix. So analysis, right? Point number one, on one side of this issue, you have anti-discrimination norms. And if our law review or some other student group said we're not open to women anymore, or people of color, or gay students, that's a problem, right? Open to everyone is, by default, generally the right policy. But not necessarily always, which brings us to the other point religious freedom, right? If you want to have a group which uh, is defined by a shared faith, then the people in the group presumably should have that faith. And if you say that everyone can be a member, then what it means is you won't have that faith-based character anymore. And so in a way, you don't have uh, the faith-based group that you, that you think you have. So this is hard. Like, there's no easy way to balance those two positions. Um, but that's what I needed them to do, is I needed them to see how hard it was analysis. That takes us to advocacy. Who could my allies be, particularly since um, I couldn't, as a matter of form, make this decision, but I sure wanted it to come out in a particular way. So, first set of allies, the leaders of the student senate, right? They felt like they were caught in the middle of something, and so when I said to them, delay this vote, delay it for months, right? This is an important issue. Let's study it. Let's study it as a group. 
they were actually quite happy to do that. And then I recruited faculty, and we had faculty members who were on different sides of the issue, but they were collegial and they all understood uh, how hard the issue was. And so basically the effort was to make this a teaching moment. And it worked out quite well, actually. Um, after several months, literally months, of a series of meetings discussing the issue, the Student Senate Committee, charged with studying this, decided to recommend an exception to the open to all rule um, for expressive association. But at the same time, the Christian Legal Society had a change in its leadership, and the new group actually wanted to be open to all anyway. So the issue became moot. People were happy, you never read about it, mission accomplished. Um, again, I think I lost, well, I think a lot of my hair turned gray during this one. Um, I'll just briefly mention a second, uh, a second example of some of these dynamics. Um, you may remember uh, President Obama's Department of Education sent a letter known as the Dear Colleague Letter to general counsels at universities with particular views about what Title IX required in disciplinary proceedings. Uh, so our general counsel, as general counsels are wont to do, got this letter and said, oh boy, we've got to make changes. And so they wanted to make lots of changes in the disciplinary uh, proceedings uh, at the law school and other places. Um, and I thought that they were not taking full account of the due process rights of people who were accused in these situations. Um, so that was my view, but I knew that the fact that it was my view personally wouldn't necessarily persuade the general counsel. So again, analysis and advocacy. Analysis, right? Um, two really important principles, each of which is critically important, right? We've got to have, uh, we've got to guarantee a safe environment to all our students. We've got to make sure people are comfortable, should have no tolerance for really bad behavior on one side. On the other side, we have to make sure allegations are true. We have to do the best job that we can to figure out what really happened, and we have to be fair to everyone. Um, it's not easy to do both of those things, but that's really what you have to do. Um, what I did is I referred the issue to a faculty committee. Our student services committee had 11 members. That year, just by happenstance, eight of them were women, uh, which I thought would lend an important perspective to this issue. And they analyzed the policy, and if anything, they were more upset about it than I was. They were emphatically, emphatically uh, unhappy with aspects of the university policy, and I just unleashed them on the general counsel's office. Um, <laughs> I don't think they liked that very much, but... Um, and then the, the last thing I did there is I also formed an advisory committee of graduates. I asked two sitting state court judges to offer a perspective and also a prominent public interest lawyer. It so happened that one of them was a university trustee, which didn't hurt either. But basically what we did is we took the hard issue head on. We tried to figure out how to navigate it, advocacy too, and uh, the policy did get better. So more to say, but the bottom line is these issues are hard, but you can make progress on them if you try hard enough. Good morning. Um, I suppose that nobody in this room wakes up uh, wondering if you want to be a dean of students. Um, the fact that I'm no longer a dean of students probably tips my hand uh, <laughs> a bit. When I look at this audience, though, I actually see you in one or more of three roles that feel particularly relevant to me this morning. And I'd like to ask you to listen to my comments through the lens of one, two, or all three of those roles. The first is that you're all alumni of an institution, two probably, so you have a particular interest in the activities and reputation of those institutions. Another role is that I suspect many of you are the parents of current or future college students. The third role is that perhaps you have already been or will be called on to represent a student or a group of students in their actions against their alma mater. So my hope is to provide you, in all three of those roles, some insight about how things look from the other side of the desk, the university administrator's view of things. And I want to start the way that I started all of my work as a student affairs professional, and it's with this simple idea, that learning takes place best in the context of community. That if we want students to learn, which most of us would agree is the goal of an education, then we have to create the kind of secure and trusting environment that encourages the intellectual risk-taking necessary to truly learn. If any of you have ever done any kind of climbing, 
either on a real rock face or a ropes course, you understand this. It's only when you feel securely belayed by someone that you trust are you willing to attempt the kind of dynamic moves necessary to ascend. And this isn't brain surgery. It is, however, brain science. What the science of our brains tells us is that only when the amygdala, that almond-shaped component of our brain that sits atop the brain stem, only when that amygdala is calm can the other parts of our brain responsible for absorbing, retaining, and analyzing information do their work. When the amygdala is activated by fear or anxiety, learning ceases. So I've always seen my work and the work of my colleagues as creating an environment where my students have the confidence to make the dynamic intellectual moves their faculty ask them to make. And we do that through building community. And it is hard work. It's the nature of humans, especially the late adolescents and young adults who often populate our campuses, to push against boundaries, to question authority, to engage in high-risk behavior that puts themselves or others at risk. After all, returning to brain science, we know that the prefrontal cortex that enables good judgment is actually under construction until the age of about 25. So it's in the context of community when breakdowns between members happen, that those of us in some position of authority mobilize to repair it. And we do so using a set of tools that we have been taught and trained to use, counseling, mediation, creative sanctioning. We give the person doing harm opportunities to repair the damage. We give those who have been harmed the opportunity to state their complaint. We confront, we educate, we heal, and we move on. Because our campuses are as fluid and as fast flowing as a river. There is always a group within the community about to depart. There's always a group about to enter. And what ties them together, the constant, is that sense of community that they feel. So of course in higher ed we are imperfect in these efforts. We get things wrong. We believe a student who it turns out is lying. We disbelieve a truth teller. We investigate incidents, but we are not infallible by any stretch. And I'd be lying myself if I told you that no student had ever been unjustly accused and sanctioned, or no student had ever gotten away with something egregious. Two categories I found myself in quite often as a student myself. And this is pretty much how it's gone for most of the 300 years of American higher education. We confront, we educate, we heal, we move on. And we do it in the context of a community that we feel a connection to and a responsibility for. Partly, what motivates us to do our work as well as we can is the knowledge that the next day, we are going to run into each other on the quad, or in a dining hall, in a classroom. So we have incentive to treat one another well. Because the tie that, that binds us, the tie between individual and community, it matters. The description of this session this morning mentions, quote, attacks on the school for failing to address a variety of problems. As my younger colleagues say, they're not wrong. We have failed in some significant ways, though I would argue that we've actually succeeded more often. Those just don't get publicized very often. And the description of this session goes on, quote, we're beginning to see pushback on behalf of outspoken students. Um, there is nothing new here. We are not beginning to see pushback. We have always seen pushback. In the year 1229 at the University of Paris, students went on strike. The same at Oxford in that century. And some of those crises ended badly, like students murdered their professors. So those of us who assume the role of dean, like our predecessor Oxford Dons, willingly step into the fray with the owners of these still developing brains. And if you've ever raised children into adulthood, you know what I mean. We accept that our students are going to get angry with us, rail against our edicts, and scream about our limit setting. And at every turn, we confront, we educate, we heal, and we move on. But no longer, because now, 
Students stop looking within the community for response and reparation. They no longer seek redress from individuals they know. They no longer lead off their efforts by scheduling an appointment with the president or the dean of students. Instead, they turn their gaze outward, or more specifically, to their screens and out into the ether, where they find sympathy and support from 100 or 1,000 people who do not know the first thing about our community, much less feel any loyalty to it. So maybe you're thinking, well, that's not such a bad thing. That if institutions of higher ed have mucked things up so badly, maybe it is time to call in the cavalry. Maybe calling attention to our misdeeds, to our refusal to listen, is a good thing, right? The overused cliche that sunlight is the best disinfectant might be true, and nothing drenches us in sunlight faster than a viral tweet. But the problem with enlisting these outsiders is that students suddenly lose all control of the conversation they were hoping to have. The narrative is now public and often distorted by others for their own agenda, which rarely includes student learning. Now this is not at all a partisan problem. Ugly accusations about their institutions and the administrators and faculty who are employed by them come from both ends of the political spectrum. Ironically, in fact, if you step back and look at the spectrum in its totality, you see a number of strategic commonalities among students at both ends. And one of those strategies is to go public, go viral, enlist outsiders, and hope that heads will roll. And sometimes they do roll. Now, sometimes they deserve to, but quite often, good people, solid professionals, lose their jobs, and in many cases, their careers, because that's what satisfies that crowd, this outside, very opinionated crowd. I asked you at the beginning to consider the three potential roles and perspectives that you might bring to these campus controversies, and I'd like to end with two approaches that I've used when I've been in a position to advise or respond to student activists, and encourage you to maybe employ these in some of those roles. Ask the student or students what strategies they have already employed to make their concerns known. Have they spoken directly to the other parties involved? Have they tried to solve the problem in-house. Students excel at making demands. Demands, I tell them, are a bit off-putting. I always encourage student activists to reframe their demands as requests and to be prepared to compromise. Higher ed does a lot of things well, but a quick pivot is not one of them. So change will not happen quickly. And then make sure the, student, or the students truly understand What's at stake? Do they want a public airing of their community's shortcomings? Keeping in mind that they are part of that community and its reputation impacts them personally. Do they want to publicly humiliate people whose career choice indicates a certain kind of commitment to students' well-being, to their well-being? Do they want to sacrifice their own learning the classroom kind, to engage in this other experience. Students who engage in some of these controversies tend to go into it loins girded, ready for battle, and they often end up missing substantial amounts of class time, which they are, I remind them, paying for. I can't answer those questions for them, but I try to ask them to consider the consequences of their actions. And if there is one through line in the work of all deans of students, it's this, your choices, your consequences. In sum, let me say again what I started with, my belief that learning takes place best in the context of community, that the building and maintaining of a community is a shared responsibility, and its loss at the hands of those who do not care about that community inflicts significant damage on the educational enterprise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we read the news, we see universities as a hotbed of wokeness and corporations as instigators and supporting actors in a woke culture. We've heard a lot of sobering accounts during um, this conference and meeting, and I don't mean to dispute any of those. I do think faculty and students both are afraid. But there are hopeful signs from universities and corporations. And so I want to spend a few minutes on those hopeful signs. So oftentimes, the hopeful signs don't make 
the headlines. So the media is really not interested or is interested in reporting, you know, students heckling Charles Murray or students at Duke recently getting up and walking out when David Strauss was speaking. They're far less interested in telling you about the real conversations that are happening around the country um, about, by students, about how they and by extension we can live together despite our deepest differences. So these conversations are happening around the country, in particular around gay rights and religious liberty, uh, a place where my own scholarship and work has been. And we see that as a culture war that feels like it's always gonna be with us, um, and it certainly feels like it's getting worse as we navigate issues around trans people. But progress is being made. It takes concerted work, and I'll just give you a concrete example. So many of you know Yale professor Bill Eskridge, is a big friend of the Federalist Society. Um, he and I created a dialogue series called the Tolerance Means Dialogues to give students a platform for sharing their experiences. Um, that takes a lot of effort. Um, it's not only our effort. Casey Maddox and I were talking yesterday. Um, he's doing courageous conversations at Coke. There are lots of you know, things in this space that are happening. But I'm gonna tell you about the Tolerance Means Dialogues for a minute. I know some people here from prior dialogues at BYU. We don't always hear good things about millennials. Millennials seem to be the most trash generation in history for some reason. And yet the dialogues are based on the premise that Generation Z and the millennials actually have grown up with unprecedented diversity. They've come up with ways to actually respect each other across those divides without submerging the differences. Um, in a sense, that gets done whether it's sexuality, whether it's religion, whether it's a political identity. And when they accord that respect to other people, it's reflected back to them. But you never hear that in the media. Now in these dialogues, which we've had from everywhere from Arizona to Alabama to Pennsylvania, at public universities like the University of Alabama, private religious colleges like BYU um, and Malone University, students write about what tolerance means to them. They get scholarships for doing that. Who wants to be against getting a tolerance scholarship? So it's sort of incentives baked into the system. But they often say that tolerance is probably too little. They've actually argue against the, the question and the frame. And they talk about the project of living together actually requiring a lot more than mere tolerance. And what they do is they share their insights about how they do that in their own lives. Now, a lot of the stories are about reconciling. So one of our winners is a young man, now a lawyer at Kirkland and Ellis, who talked about his father urging him as a teenager to go to gay conversion therapy. Okay, for him that was a non-starter. Um, it was also a deep wound. Um, and he shares a, a discussion in his essay about tolerance. He says that it requires him to accept the reality that other people have core values. And I'm just reading from his essay. It requires him to accept that he cannot change the hearts and minds of all people, including his father. Now that's a deep testament to tolerance. Oh, sorry, flipping back and forth between pages here for a second. Um, you know, at these dialogues, I'll give you an example from Alabama. We had DEI officers there celebrating the winners, talking about these kinds of ideas. They were seated next to judges and university leaders, AIDS activists, religious leaders, and gobs of students all in the same room packed in at the University of Alabama, which I don't think makes the news either. Um, so I think it's possible to do these things. The basic way they unfold is there are dialogue catalysts like me and Bill Eskridge. Sometimes my dialogue partner will be a trans man, Shannon Minter, who's an amazing litigator, by the way. And often Bill or Shannon or someone will start and talk about their own experience as a trans person or a gay man. Now, if you know Bill Eskridge, you know what a believer in pluralism he is and how much he believes in the rights of religious people to be authentically themselves as well. So he creates a kind of parody of these things. I sort of take the pointy-headed academic role and talk about civil rights and how civil rights 
don't have to be a zero sum. They're more like puzzle pieces that can be fit together, but it requires lawmakers to do that, not judges. Um, so apologies, judge, but it generally has to be done by judges if we're gonna do that. And then center stage is taken by our dialogue winners, and they, frankly, smoke the rest of us just talking about what's happened to them in their young lives and how they have managed to get over the friction that everybody else sees at the university or in culture. And these are not dumbed down observations by any means. And I'll just give you an example. One of our dialogue uh, winners self-identified Ariel Brown as a African-American Christian. She was getting her PhD. And she shared her experience with what she called discretion, uh, discrimination and microaggressions. The microaggressions were people assuming, and here I'm reading from her, that because of her spiritual, spirituality and her character, that they were automatically rejected because it was assumed that her Christian identity influ influenced her to hate the LGBTQ plus community. And then she goes on and talks about how deeply unfair it was to impute that to her, uh, which I think is incredibly powerful and something that we need to remember in society. So um, the dialogues, as I said, are kicked off by dialogue catalysts. The winners then read their essays. In some sense, the Q&A is where the real stuff happens. So at Arizona State, we had our first virtual dialogue because COVID. Um, and one of the students who had the first question was a Federalist Society member who said that she had been called a Nazi by other people at ASU. And the moderator, as the associate dean in that particular case, actually addressed that and talked about how the university had grappled with that. I spoke directly to it too, which I think is important just by itself, that a person felt like this institution actually felt like that was wrong and said it publicly, as it is, obviously. We had another dialogue where a young man who ended up working on this uh, dialogue series with us, a guy named Bryce Toon, um, he asked a question. He said, you know, I'm a Christian, but I support the LGBT community. And I'm pro-gun, but I favor Medicare for all. So how am I supposed to, as an undergraduate, think about like these commitments? And you know, the answer is not really complicated. You know, his commitments don't have to match up with some package of like political commitments on the right or the left. Bryce gets to be Bryce. Um, but he needs to be affirmed in that and talked about, talk, he needs to hear that. Um, our commitments are not either or, they can be both and. And we get to decide those things that we think are important. I think that's the kind of work hopefully that um, Lee Burnett and others I know are doing as deans of students all over the country. So one of the things that I think is really important and one of the reasons that universities get these really horrible outcomes is they are not occupying the field. If you want to have this kind of dialogue, you actually have to work at it, which means you, the university, needs to create the context where this kind of frank dialogue, where people on the left and the right can both share their experiences and talk about how they actually want to be respectful of other people and how they've done that, that actually takes work. Now, it helps if the chancellor puts you on his Instagram. So thank you, Chancellor Jones. And it helps when esteemed faculty, you know, um, that, that are even woke sometimes, tell students that they need to come to these dialogues because they are ultimately about tolerance of all people. Um, and it helps to have those DEI officers there. So we had our first trans winner um, recently. And then later, I was told by the moderator that she had sued the university. And I'm like, oh, well, this is not good. Um, so what we did is we created a green room and we brought the highest DEI officer of the university to the green room with our funders, Templeton Religion Trust, and we all visited before the dialogue about that so that if there was some blow up, it was gonna happen there in the little green room uh, and not on the stage. And it's just one small example of all the care that has to go into actually being able to have dialogues that you know, move people's hearts and minds, I think. Now, we have an amazing team, a ground 
game that we run as outsiders to different universities that we visit. Um, and, you know, it's a huge amount of work. We spend weeks writing every single registered student organization. We bake parity in uh, to the dialogue so it projects tolerance. Federalist Society has been an amazing partner in this, by the way. Federalist Society student chapters co-sponsor with the American Constitution Society, like the evildoers on the other side. They're actually sometimes co-sponsoring for the very first time in the history of the chapter. Christian Legal Society will be there out alongside outlaw. And the projection of that is that we don't have to be at loggerheads. We can come together and have a dialogue. It helps that Bill Eskridge has, you know, lent his time to this. It helps that Templeton pays for everything, so it's very easy to ask people to host us because we pay for everything and do all the work. But in any event, um, we are now on a stable footing for the next three years, so shameless plug for us, and then I'll make some comments about, um, about corporations. You know, we would love to host these dialogues if you think that your university would benefit from that. We co-convene with you. Um, so if you are interested in that real kind of dialogue, I'd be happy to visit with you after. Okay, so I'm a Pollyanna. You can see that from these comments. Um, but I think there are some promising things in corporations, too. Um, like universities, they're a microcosm of the world. Now, we spend all of our lives at work, it seems. Um, it's important that in work we bring our whole selves to the workplace, including our religious commitments, and that we do our best work when we're able to be authentically ourselves at work, just like we are at university. Now, inside of companies, we've seen a rise of affinity groups for employees of faith um, in places like Zurich and American Express and Allstate and Cummins. Now, these groups that are organized around faith commitments are taking a page they're copying LGBT affinity groups that have risen up decades before in companies. And these groups are actually collaborating together. They're coming together to talk about being, you know, fully themselves at work. Now this recognition and structure, I think, can actually help place people of faith on an equal footing or nearly equal or more equal footing inside of companies because it makes their needs seen. Now, ideally, you know, their interests and rights are going to be respected without having anybody like our friends from Beckett sue a company because they want to take a moment to pray during the day, right? Far better for this to come up within a company and people recognize that it's important to respect their employees and their faith commitments as well as their LGBTQ identity or any other identity. Um, recently, Andy Koppelman at Northwestern and I Bill Eskrich and others, convened state lawmakers in the Midwest around the idea that religious liberty and gay rights don't have to be at loggerheads. And we brought Fortune 500 company officers. And that matters because in our cultural war, we think that the only side of the ledger that these companies play on is for the far left. And that's true in many, many things. But it's not true in all things. They actually have an interest in helping lawmakers figure out how these rights are going to coexist. And I will stop right there. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. I'm going to take a couple of minutes and speak to the corporate management uh, aspects of this issue, especially the externally facing aspects of corporate activities. And let me begin with my conclusions. Uh, first, that uh, corporations should remain focused on their purpose and business objectives and not stray into issues that do not impact or are not impacted by those objectives. Second, that businesses should not speak to every issue should not acquiesce to every stakeholder and cannot be all things to all people, including their employees. And third, that the issues that corporations do engage on and speak to should be ones that contribute to their business objectives and to creating or protecting shareholder value. Now, I'm not suggesting any changes to corporate law or legal remedies for shareholders. What I am suggesting is that corporate executives apply the same focus on business objectives in this area that they do elsewhere in the business. 
Some quick context here is important, as the purpose of the modern corporation has been debated now for at least 50 years. Milton Friedman's 1970 essay laid out a clear worldview. Shareholders own corporations, whose purpose is to increase shareholder value. Boards and management should be focused exclusively on that objective. And so that shareholder theory of the purpose of corporations has had lasted impact and is seen in much of corporate governance today, including how corporate objectives are set and how senior executives are compensated. However, an alternative theory also developed, known as the stakeholder theory or stakeholder capitalism, which holds that corporations are accountable not only to their shareholders, but also to society, especially to address impacts from their operations, such as environmental, labor, and community issues. And over the past 20 years, aspects of uh, stakeholder capitalism have grafted onto the shareholder theory as companies see issues related to their operations, such as environmental footprint, supply chain, and the communities where they're located as impacting shareholder value. And we've also seen increasing investor interest in ESG issues, further bringing stakeholder capitalism into shareholder value. Larry Fink of BlackRock's annual letters to CEOs, with BlackRock representing, in many cases, their largest shareholder, I can tell you gets a lot of boardroom attention. And these developments are also reflected in the Business Roundtable's 2019 updated statement on the purpose of the corporation, which is consistent where companies have been moving for a decade or more. So the question is, where should a business draw the line? What issues have a strong connection to shareholder value, even if they're a step or two removed? And which issues have no connection to business purpose or worse, risk having a negative impact for shareholders? What constitutes appropriate stakeholder capitalism that can contribute to shareholder value versus what's an exercise in woke capitalism that can potentially damage shareholder value? So how should corporate executives uh, uh, think about this? From my perspective, the key is focus, 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 keeping your eyes on the business and not getting distracted. Corporate executives insist on discipline and focus when engaged in business strategy, investment decisions, and business plan execution. They divest non-core businesses, they outsource support services so as not to distract the organization, they strive to align employees around a single set of objectives. The same focus should be true on engaging on public issues and in public debate. Plus, companies don't have much experience outside their core business. They're ill-suited to speak on issues beyond their expertise and are more likely to get in trouble when they do. I think we need only look at the Georgia uh, voting law and, and some companies' response to that uh, as evidence of uh, that point. And the farther they stray from their core business, the more likely are they are to get uh, called out for hypocrisy. And uh, Woke Inc. is a great read on this point, uh, full of such examples. So what are some of the reasons why corporations might speak to issues outside their core business? And we always need to be asking ourselves, do these meet the stakeholder value standard? Well, the first is customers. Some companies make a strategic decision as part of their marketing plan. Think Nike. Is that based on market research? Have they thought about the business consequences? Do companies really want to write off large groups of potential customers? As Michael Jordan famously said, Republicans buy sneakers too. Employees, and there's an increasing expectation from employees that their employer will speak out on issues that matter to them, even if not related to business objectives. Now this can create a serious risk of a loss of focus, uh, create a distraction, risk losing a one company mindset, and can really undermine company culture, inclusion, and employee engagement as some companies sit on their hands, some, excuse me, employees sit on their hands and silently dissent. And then third, you know, issues of politics and reputation. Some companies engage on issues outside their business priorities to seek favor with the party in power or reputational benefit from the media and opinion leads. And here again, the question always should be, what's the business purpose? You know, because this, I think, is an especially dangerous area 
Picking sides in politics inevitably leads to an equal and opposite political reaction, sometimes as soon as the next election. Finally, sometimes it appears there's no business justification at all for a company speaking to an issue, which I think of as the C-suite equivalent of the faculty lounge. Now, the best way to, to counteract that echo chamber of the corporate faculty lounge is to have the discipline to insist that there be a tangible business purpose for speaking out on an issue. Now, because these issues involve questions of shareholder value and corporate reputation, board oversight is really important. Board should have regular discussions with management about the issues on which the company engages publicly and the processes that are in place for prioritizing those issues based on business objectives. In recent years, activist shareholder groups have pressed boards to regularly review companies' political and policy engagement. They intended this to put a spotlight on company advocacy and encourage engagement on broader ESG-type issues. However, I believe that boards should use these same reviews to ensure that the company's external engagement is focused on matters that have a connection to business objectives and creating or protecting shareholder value. Finally, let me close with just a couple suggestions for business leaders. First, to proactively consider whether to engage on public issues as part of business strategy. It's not a separate thing. It's not a separate category. It should all contribute to the business plan. And to engage only on issues that advance a business objective to create or protect shareholder value. Second, not to be overly reactive, not to get restricted. It will be necessary to adjust the plan, but to, to keep your eyes on the business goal. Third, to develop policy principles based on your company mission and ensure that any political activities are based on those principles. Those principles become the safe harbor in a complex political world. And finally, and importantly, to communicate with employees to explain how a mission-driven company, how as a mission-driven company, you focus on the business and that it is by achieving your corporate mission that you make a difference in the world. I encourage you to take a look at Brian Armstrong's blog, Coinbase is a mission-focused company, which I think is a, a great example of executive leadership and executive communication in this area. Uh, thank you for your interest, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Let's begin with uh, a, just a comment about Rich's use of ESG, environmental, social, and, and governance factors. Um, for those of you in the audience, and this was new to me in preparation as well, it's this idea that there are certain demands, although as Lee might say requests, that individual groups are being made of either of a university or of a corporation. And uh, those uh, ESG factors uh, might uh, also be characterized as stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism, this distinction that exists. Or it might um, manifest itself in demands that are being made uh, on a university level, say by groups that will go forward. I'd like to uh, start the discussion by talking about a common criticism that happens of colleges and universities as well as corporations, that they are not prepared to investigate or adjudicate or to respond to or to speak to these types of demands or requests as they're being made. Uh, whether it be a uh, for-profit or non-for-profit uh, corporation responding to a non-shareholder stakeholder, whether it be a university dean of students or university um, administration having to respond to these types of requests being made, I want to open it up to the floor for comments that our speakers may have on that uh, type of observation of some that the corporation or university are not fully prepared to respond. Lee? Um, again, you're not wrong. Uh, I think that, as Rich said, there is a, a, a level of focus that is happening on a college campus uh, related to the learning enterprise. And if we have limited bandwidth, we have um, limited personnel, where do we want to focus our energy? And the energy 
traditionally been focused around trying to provide students with the education that's promised them, trying to provide uh, other stakeholders with the research and knowledge generation that a university exists for. So really this begins to feel like kind of an adjacent set of tasks that then overtakes the educational enterprise. Uh, so I think that we have gotten better at it, but we are stacking sandbags against a rising tide of dissent, frustration, and um, aggressiveness by outside forces, and sometimes feels like we can't, we can't get ahead of that to stay focused on what we are there to do. Dean? So I, I do agree there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a saying in management that if it's not a priority, it's a distraction. And I do think, just to align myself with the good points that Rich has made, um, stakeholder capitalism is, in my opinion, a really flawed idea. And uh, so I just want to speak for a moment about for-profit companies, but I'm doing this drawing on what I've already said about not-for-profits. So um, one of the ways in which nonprofits go astray is when they're not clear about what they're trying to do. And that lack of clarity could lead them to be too comfortable with decisions that maybe were good years ago but aren't good anymore. And frankly, it can also be a cover when people want to do things that are good for themselves but don't really advance the mission. So remember I said, um, the great thing about for-profit companies is that it's harder to get away with that because there's this clear metric of profitability. But what stakeholder capitalism is trying to do is to dilute the metric and say, well, it's not just about profit. It's also about helping the community, about helping the environment, and so on. So just to make this point a bit more vividly, I want you to think about being on the board of three different institutions. Two are for-profit companies, one is a nonprofit. So let's start with a for-profit company that only is committed to shareholder maximization, sort of the Milton Friedman type company. You're on the board, you go to a meeting, and management says to you, we need to focus. There are two businesses that we run. Hard, we'll call them an easy. Hard and easy. Hard is hard because it's more challenging for them. Easy is, well, that's more like a vacation. And they say to you, so we want to stop with hard. We want to shut that one down. And we want to just run with easy. We think that's the way to go. So obviously the question you're going to ask is, OK, but before we make this decision, just tell me about the earnings of each of these, of each of these divisions. And if they look a little sheepish and they say, well, actually, hard is more profitable, but we, we just don't think it's worth it. Well, you're not going to let them get away with that. You're going to say, wait a minute. No, what are you doing? Like, we, if this is the real value add, this is the one we do. And if you have to shut one down, shut the other one down, right? So it's the ability to see through the self-interested suggestion that is so important at a for-profit company. So you stop that. Good job. You go to your next board meeting. It's the not-for-profit. Same conversation. Let's shut down hard. Let's keep doing easy. Well, you can't say which of them is more profitable. You need to find a different way to figure out which advances the mission more effectively. And that's possible, but it takes a lot more work. So there's more of a risk that the self-interested decision slips by you. Third meeting is the, 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 the woke company, the stakeholder capitalism company, where management says, OK, let's get rid of hard. Let's go with easy. And you say, wait, why? What's the profitability? And they say, no, no, it's not as profitable, but it helps us advance these 15 other really important social goals. It's harder to argue with that. But do you really know that that's what they're trying to do? Or maybe this is just something that's self-interested. So I think the fact that companies are pushed to focus on profitability is really good. It's really important. And this trend away from it, however well-intentioned, I think leads to very bad outcomes. Rich? Uh, I, I agree with the, the dean's uh, comments. Just add a, a couple of observations. In terms of, prep, of like whether companies are prepared for this, you know, there's, there's probably a distinction between larger companies and smaller companies. And a smaller entrepreneur would say the fact that the large company is focusing on all this stuff, while well, they're focusing on this stuff, I'm going to go, uh, you know, beat them in the marketplace uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, t t t t take, their, take their business away from them. Uh, so there's, there's definitely a, like a startup versus established company issue here. Second, on Stakeholder capitalism, stakeholder capitalism becomes shareholder capitalism when the stakeholders go buy 100 shares <laughs> uh, and then start, uh, for public companies, 
and, th and then start su submitting uh, shareholder re uh, resolutions uh, uh, to the annual meeting, which becomes then an important thing that companies need to manage as they recognize that, that the vast majority of their shareholders probably disagree with the perspective of those activist shareholders. Um, and then finally, I've seen a, a, a sort of a trend of the sort of demands of, sh of uh, activist stakeholders starting with like internally focused things. Like wh what are you doing about your own environmental policies for the impacts that your facilities are having? Sort of moving from that, from internally focused things about the company to what are you doing about public issues that don't relate to your business? And that you know, becomes a very slippery slope. Robin, when you get invited in by in a university environment, um, are they prepared? I think of this the BYU situation that you're talking about. Are you going in because it's a fire drill, or are you? Uh, is there an anticipation of these external problems and how they deal with them? Well, I think there's an anticipation. I will say the universities, as I said earlier, need to occupy this field. Um, oftentimes, these dialogues are a data point that when something later happens at the university, a student does something that seems hateful and may be hateful, the university is able to say, we respect all people here because of this track record. Unfortunately, this is not just a single one-shot dialogue. That kind of track record has to be built and rebuilt and built and rebuilt. Um, so I think it can be important to the reputation of the university to have done this type of work before something skitters off the rails. Um, I will say I think faculty need support too because faculty, you know, are having these, they're the primary interface with students and oftentimes something that they say can be misconstrued um, and, or, you know, just blown up and trying to put together an apparatus that is there for faculty when that happens I think is really important. Lee, in, in the university environment, um, when a um, issue arises and there's an attempt to solve it within the community, such that those community bonds remain um, tight, is it uh, always um, an external force coming in because um, of the desires of that external force, or is there a gap or a need in the university that needs to be filled? I think that external forces are sometimes the most pernicious and, and difficult to respond to in the, within the context of that community. Um, I think there are always um, issues that arise within the community uh, based on differences that students and faculty bring to the community uh, based again on, on sort of the, the age and the developmental needs of students to push back and really establish a, a unique identity for themselves. And I feel like within the community, those individual differences can be managed with a lot of the tools that we've always used. Um, the, the, kinds of, the kinds of dialogues that, that Robin's referring to are dialogues that internally campuses have been having for hundreds of years. You know, it's, it's the free and open exchange of ideas that have, has built American higher education into the force that it is. Uh, so I, yeah, I feel like when we've got internal differences, internal problems, we have effective tools to respond 90% of the time. Dean at Columbia, if these issues arose, you gave an example um, uh, from um, involving the Christian Legal Society. Was there a more recent example involving the Federal Society in the last couple of years? So there was actually a um, somewhat different situation, but it also helps to illustrate the point. Um, I'm a big fan of our chapter. I'm sort of one of the small group of faculty or kind of informal faculty advisors to them. They're very capable. Um, so just about mm, ten, eight, nine months ago, um, in the wake of January 6th, the chapter was sort of using a group chat to air different views about what had happened. And um, I had occasion later to read the group chat. I was quite impressed. It was very thoughtful. But it turns out that a couple of students who weren't in the chapter 
managed to get into the chat uh, by, I suppose, pretending to be someone else. And then they started taking these um, statements out of context and posting them on social media and trying to depict the students in an unfavorable light. And look, at, at some level, um, we, as lawyers, understand that we're criticized sometimes and that's just part of it and you have to get used to that. At the same time, these were very unfair characterizations of what they'd actually said uh, and it was sort of heated. So they reached out to me and a couple of others. We met with them. The good news is that the um, others at the law school sort of agreed that this was really important, that people be able to express what they thought and that these were not fair characterizations. So the thing sort of died down. And again, I don't think you ever read about it. Um, but the point is, um, and I go back to distinguishing between students and faculty, and I did that before in a different way. Um, if someone wants to criticize me, someone wants to say, what you said is wrong, it's terrible, et cetera. Okay, fine, look, I'm, um, I'm a tenured member of the faculty, people can say what they want. But if you're a 24-year-old student with a promising career ahead of you and all of a sudden you're worried that people are gonna try to depict you as something you aren't, uh, it's incredibly unfair and uh, it's important for people to be supportive of it, to try to help people learn from that but also help people overcome that. So, uh, not always easy. Robin, the Dean's example brings in social media and from some of the examples you've given, you've talked a lot about in-person dialogue or in-person conversations, the green room example you gave. Social media has got to make this incredibly complicated when you're talking about these issues. Yeah, we actually have a social media strategy or piece of this. We give a social media engagement prize at the dialogue. So one person, ideally a student, takes a prize, not somebody else. But um, people who tweet questions, those questions will get pulled um, and discussed by the panelists. So you could be live streaming in from Ireland, as we've had people do, and that question is read. Um, but the prize actually tries to get people engaged virtually but also in the place. Part of the problem is people don't want to ask even a question sometimes, but they feel safe putting it on the Twitter feed for the lecture. Um, and then we can talk about that as a group of panelists. So social media can be used to actually make it safer to have conversation. And it's not always about not being able to have the conversation. Rich, we've talked about uh, both inter internal facing and external facing responses of a corporation. And I think for a lot of people here, what came to mind was what the baseball all-star game this summer. Uh, and uh, uh, whether or not Major League Baseball had had a strategy, at the same time, it's got to obviously for its own hiring and own employment have um, aspects of a strategy with regard to how to deal with these issues. I is it? Is it only the very large corporations or entities like that they are going to have the means to be able to have a, both an outward and an inward facing strategy? Or how does that work with regard to uh, entities that are not that large? Well, it's, it's important to sort of align positioning you know, internally and externally so that you know, an external position c can have a really deleterious effect internally on uh, in inclusion among employees, uh, upon engagement uh, among employees. Uh, pl planning ahead, thinking ahead, you know, having a strategy about what, what's really important to an organization, what its principles are, and communicating it internally to, uh, to employees be, be, you know, becomes very important. I mean, the, the all-star game, uh, and, uh, and I'm thinking about like Delta, you know, in connection with the, the Georgia uh, uh, voting law, to me demonstrates the, the risk of, of, of reacting and sort of say, okay, we gotta get a statement out there today. You know, we need to be in the media s cycle. We need, to, we need to do this both because of our perception of what, where our employees are, uh, but for what, what, whatever reason. And that just I increases the, the, the risk of getting beyond your skis uh, and being in the position, for example, where, as I understand it, uh, uh, Colorado had m more restrictive early voting than Georgia would have you know, had under the new law, or that the airline had hubs in other cities 
that were at airports in cities and states that had more restrictive voting than Georgia, and not like you know thinking two steps uh, two steps ahead. So I, th I think you know alignment with principles, consistency in internal and external communication, and thinking a step or two ahead. Thank you. Well, what we'd like to do now is open uh, the floor up for questions, uh, and specifically, I'm going to enter. I'm going to. Um, invoke my judicial prerogative here and uh, ask uh, to ensure that you're posing a question. Also, we ask for you to give um, just your affiliation, your name and affiliation, pose your question, and also if you could let us know, is this to the full panel or to an individual panelists? There may be panelists who want to comment on another panelist's answer. Roger. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm Roger Pilon from the Cato Institute. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Mr. Bagger, uh, as a student of uh, Milton Friedman, I uh, enjoyed your remarks very much. Um, I want to put to you, however, the following uh, situation. Um, it's no more recent than this morning's Wall Street Journal, page one, an article about how American investors and corporations are furthering by their actions the interests of Xi Jinping and the Chinese uh, government, uh, which presents the short-term, long-term interests uh, for the corporation. And this isn't even in corporations alone. In fact, uh, at uh, universities, the, in, the, uh, uh, the uh, tuition from uh, foreign students, especially Chinese students, and at Columbia, in fact, the uh, Confucian Institute was also a, a hot issue there, whether Columbia should keep it or not. So if you would uh, please uh, comment on that. It uh, seems to me a tougher issue than the examples that you gave. <laughs> Excellent question because I do think it is a, 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 t a tougher example and creates some, some really challenging questions for, uh, f uh, for companies who, that are weighing uh, you know, sort of market opportunities in China, but they're also uh, weighing, uh, you know, what's going to happen to their intellectual property, uh, you know, when they're doing business uh, in China, and are also potentially opening themselves up to, uh, you know, again, some of the hypocrisy examples uh, that have been uh, uh, noted pretty, uh, pretty widely. Uh, so I think these these questions about China are really are very prominent among what like management and boards are dealing with and you know so is it worth it what's what's the upside and what are the uh, what are the challenges uh, you know that they have as global companies let's go on to the far side name affiliation and question sure uh, Casey Maddox I'm with the Koch Institute and with Americans for Prosperity uh, my question is particularly as to to um, academic on the academic side um, so, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for universities having to navigate uh, this particular moment where uh, tensions seem to be so high. But I think a lot of the conversation can end up being around sort of application of policies and what do we do when sort of warring tribes are, are coming at one another. The, the question I have is, um, you know, my experience, I've litigated against universities before. I was actually co-counsel in CLSB Martinez. Next time I would ask for a trigger warning. Uh, before mentioning that case, but um, if it, it seems to me that if uh, that a whole lot of the, the problems could be resolved or at least could be lessened if there was more preparation on the front side. So when you have a lot of universities that have, uh, particularly in public universities, have really unconstitutional policies, and they write those policies down and they go through general counsel and they get published, and then students uh, respond. Uh, to, to a crisis that's happening on campus using those policies. I'll give you one quick example. Um, the Uzabunim case, the uh, Supreme Court heard earlier this year, Georgia Gwinnett College. And that's a case where the university wrote down and went through multiple levels of review and they ultimately published uh, a policy that said that uh, no student could disturb the peace and tranquility of another student. So a student then, of course, goes out and starts talking about his faith on a public university campus. Another student complained that their tranquility was disturbed. 
and the university fought that for multiple years to the Supreme Court trying to defend that policy. That was a sort of a conflict between two students, but if the university had just decided, hey, let's not create a blatantly unconstitutional policy that's going to tell someone whenever your tranquility is disturbed, you have a right to be able to complain about another student, could have solved a lot of problems on the front side. So I'm curious, why, why do, uh, why isn't that happening more? Why aren't universities more intentionally, deliberately working to make their policies comply with the First Amendment, and would that really help? Um. Well, I'm not sure I agree entirely with the premise that universities are not working. I think there is a, a great deal of work being done. It's an iterative process. Um, every time there is new case law, I can assure you that institutions are studying it carefully. There are a lot of policies that are, um, yeah, unconstitutional or really problematic. And over time, those have gotten changed. Um, I mean, I'll just point out, like, FIRE shows that 90 almost 90 percent of schools have policies, written policies, that are inconsistent with the First Amendment. So, I, I mean, yeah, again, you, you can, um, I'm not sure I agree with all of the premises and definitions that FIRE uses to identify those. But I know that there are institutions that are constantly reevaluating their policies and making changes. Um, so it's not what it was 10 years ago and it's not what it will be in 10 years. But it, as I said, it's a slow process, right? Higher ed, you know, it's turning a battleship with your bare hands. Um, it happens very slowly. So I'll give you a very short lawyer's answer, which is obviously the First Amendment technically doesn't apply to private universities, right? Now I will tell you that when we were confronting our own version of the Martinez case, I was clear both that the First Amendment didn't technically apply, but that First Amendment values were critically important and therefore we should act as if it did. Um, but I guess the second point I would make is that that was a five to four decision. Um, my own opinion, and, and the way the court came out is they said actually an open to all policy is okay. Um, I would have come out the other way. I know you would have as well. Um, but I think this brings us to a, a, a slightly different version of your question, which is how do we balance all these competing interests? And it's really quite difficult. And I think it, the part of what you said that I thought was especially compelling is when you said, well, it's the application of the principles that's so hard. And it really is. And just to maybe offer a further thought on that to emphasize what I'm, what I'm trying to convey. Um, how do we feel, you know, this, this disturbing someone's tranquility, like it's, it's easy to poke fun at that, to be honest. And um, I think part of what you're supposed to get at a university is the sense that you believe something and you can believe it with all your heart, but not everyone does. And that's a fact of life. And it means that it's your job to make your case to other people, hopefully in a way that persuades them. But it is also your job to get used to the fact that people aren't always going to agree. That's what life is in a vibrant democracy with free speech rights and all the rest. And so good. And I, but on the other hand, I wish it was all that simple. My mom was uh, class of 1959 at Columbia Law School. She was one of 12 women. Um, one of the things that a professor liked to do is to have, quote, ladies' day, uh, where the women were kind of on call and subjected to a particular, um, a particularly rigorous inquisition that never applied to the men. Um, another time, my mother had the experience of offering an answer, well, Professor, I feel, and he shut her down and said, women feel, men think, right? We shouldn't do that, right? And the answer to that is not, oh, well, it's your job to get used to being treated that way. No, right? So we want a certain measure of collegiality at the same time. And the point is, how can we as educators, and frankly, as a country, because it applies to everybody, how can we learn to be collegial in the way we disagree? And I think that the better we do at that, um, the, 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 the better the world is, and maybe the, the good question that you asked becomes easier to answer. Robin. So Casey, um, it occurs to me that a lot of times universities want a very clear policy so that the people who have to decide what happens in this contest from this person in this dorm room and their neighbor in the next dorm room, you know, it can be executed on. I, as a lawyer, think you should never have a policy you're not willing to enforce. So if it's a dumb policy, that's probably bad. Um, 
But I do think there are interests because the university is a place where people have their home in tranquility. You know, if the guy in the dorm room next to me means I can't study, that's a problem. Um, what I think could happen here is, this, is exactly the thing that you're, you told me about the other day. That we could have just sort of broke the impasse maybe by getting these folks to sit in the same room. Um, you know, let's kind of the Obama, let's have a beer over here and talk about this, you know, or the dinner uh, discussions that you were talking about. It's really unfortunate that that isn't the way we resolve disputes sometimes. And I think that's really the hard question. Why isn't it? Question. Hi, my name is Marissa Cohen. I'm getting my LLM at Emory University right now. And a question I have goes to the due process and to the discourse that you were talking about. A lot of times in university, I'm, I'm seeing that students fail to have a discourse directly with their professors with an issue about a professor. Right away, if something happens in the classroom, they circumvent the professor and they go to the dean or higher up. Um, but then also at the same time, there then feels like there's no due process for the professor, right? The professor can't address the person who's making the claims. Uh, we recently had a professor who said the N-word and his class was immediately drained. All the students didn't even get to have the next class with him for him to apologize. The class was just canceled and then um, he wasn't able to teach for the rest of the year. And likewise, a lot of students complain now too about the Socratic method because these professors say, you know, I, I'm, I use she pronouns, but I get called Mr. P Mr. Cohen all of the time. I correct them moving on with my life, but a lot of students are saying that, you know, this is an assault on them, an assault on student identities by having this, and then, again, they circumvent the professor, and now it's a larger campus issue instead of something that could have been a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. So how are there sort of ways that are protecting the professors but are also hearing these student concerns? So I think your question comes from a commendable impulse, and as a member of a faculty, I appreciate your concern for our well-being. Um, I will <laughs> say, though, uh, that there are hierarchies in universities, and it's a lot to ask for students who know they're going to be graded by a professor, and for students who know that the professor will be in a position to, um, I don't want to say embarrass them, but put them on the spot and ask hard questions and maybe reveal to their classmates that they weren't quite prepared. It's a lot to ask for them to have to go to the professor first to say, hey, what you said, um, I didn't appreciate that. Now, having said that, it is important for universities not just to prejudge things, but to try to get the full picture. And so there need to be conversations. And I do think that at some point, it can be very healthy um, for there to be a subsequent meeting where the professor talks about what she or he meant and tries to um, both reassure students but also maybe to explain why what they did was okay or you know whatever it is. Um, think about mediating challenges within your family. Um, and I think about the fact that my extended family, we love each other, but we do have disagreements and sometimes they're not altogether pleasant, but you have to deal with them. I think it's, it's that metaphor. If you think about a university that way, then you're kind of on the right track. Honesty, collegiality, um, and holding people accountable. Uh, you have to do all of those things. Yeah, you're absolutely right that there are, um, there's a power dynamic that is sometimes really uh, difficult for a student to overcome in a, um, and wanting to have that kind of conversation. I, I, I do think there is learning happening. Uh, let me use the example of, of, of the N-word. Um, I, I would like to think that people are just going to stop using it, like that there have been enough situations that have arisen from even contextualized use of it to perhaps um, suggest to faculty that they just don't use the word or use the phrase that describes the word or anything. Like, is there some other way they can get their point across? Uh, and I think that's how change happens, right? We, nobody wants to be the subject of a story in inside higher ed on a Monday morning because their students have walked out of class. Um, and I, and I think those situations continue to happen because there's a sort of stubbornness on both sides. Like, I'm right and I, w I should be able to do this. Uh, you know, I should be able to um, keep someone from disturbing my tranquility. Uh, but I think, as, as Robin said, it, 
those conversations, and you know, as David gave the analogy, those conversations within the sense of community or family that can happen can be really instructive. Uh, that's what changes our minds. I, I have been influenced throughout my entire career by students. Students have changed my heart, my mind, repeatedly over 30 years of my career by having conversations with me and me having conversations with them. Three students sitting around the table in my office discussing a really difficult situation that's happened is going to have a lot more impact on me as a leader of a university than 3,000 3, signatures on a change.org petition. Uh, so how do we get students and faculty and others into those conversations? How do we create that kind of safe environment? And that's the hard daily grinding work of building community and caring about one another in multiple places in multiple ways. Well, well I'll just chime in on the same point about power. I do think it is hard to go directly to the faculty member. Um, you know, your point about Mr. and Ms. is hard. I, when I, I started fairly young as a teacher, and it just seems super weird to me to be calling like my students who are almost my age, Mr. and Ms., and asking them to stand at the microphone when they were, or not the microphone, but stand, you know, when they were speaking in class. So I just roll with first names. Didn't always serve me when I was a young teacher because I'd have a faculty member who came in to review my class and the students were calling me by the first name. <laughs> they didn't feel like I had created the right distance. But I still just roll with first names for that reason. The pronoun thing is really, well, and I want to say a word just about the N word. Um, you know, if somebody used the word bitch or God forbid the C word, I would just stop. Like, I, could, I couldn't hear everything that they said after that. And I think that's the, what's happening pedagogically in the classroom. And, and we can call that triggering. Um, I just can't see, as Lee said, the value pedagogically of needing to recite this word, just like I wouldn't use generally the word bitch and certainly would not use the C word. Um, but in any event, I think there are words like that for us and we should remember that. And as educators, the whole point is, I need to be able to talk to you and you need to be able to hear me. Um, and we contour and context that with the way we're presenting our material. I'll just stop on that point. Judge, last question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Judge John Curry from Chicago. Um, uh, I really appreciate your input on these collaborative types of uh, uh, ways to try to resolve these conflicts that come up. So this question is more to the two deans and the professor. Uh, but let me pose a rhetorical question. Do you not understand that these instances are really, th that what is going on there is a movement? In other words, there's cohesiveness to it. It may vary in different ways and, and uh, reflect different issues, race, gender issues, sexuality, et cetera. But it is an actual movement, and it's a movement that has strategies. And to the extent you may calm them down in these instances of collaboration, they're going to come back again. And uh, so it's really only a tech. Do you not understand that, and that it is very negatively affecting very many uh, universities and colleges across the country already? And then secondarily, wouldn't, another rhetorical question, uh, wouldn't you agree that a position taken by the uh, leadership of the University of Chicago some few years ago making a very strong statement about, about the mission of liberal education in the country, and that should be a benchmark to pose when dealing with these issues. The, a couple of the failures I've seen, uh, the University of Chicago statement was in a way a uh, reaction to my alma mater's president, President Mort Shapiro of the Nor Northwestern University, who uh, published a, a syndicated column about safe spaces. Well, just two years, just last year, that came back to bite him because the safe space students are all protesting on his family lawn at his home day after day, night after night. And uh, my other alma mater, Vanderbilt University, in having an equality position in the university, it resulted in pushing off the uh, Roman Catholic ministry from the, ca from the campus which remains the, the, the situation to today. So those are my two questions. Do you not acknowledge it's a movement? And secondarily, shouldn't there be a strong statement made to, to anchor uh, dealing with it? Thank you. Dean. 
So I appreciate the two excellent points that you made. I, I would say this. First of all, I, caveat, right? I finished being dean in 2014. I think the world has moved a bit since then. Uh, I was away from the university. I came back. I could see some of the differences. Um, having said that, I think the formula, at least for me, is as follows. Rigorous, relentless, almost merciless in ensuring that people can say what they want to say, right? Free speech is critical. I agree with the University of Chicago's take on that. And at the same time, although we can be relentless and tough about ideas, we should be respectful as people of each other. And I'll say, I, I remember my first year as a law student, first couple of months, we get called on, we were given the job of trying to make the case, and I remember pounding the table a couple of times. It wasn't working. <laughs> and if you think about the really good lawyers you know and the things that you've learned over time, like that's not the way to persuade people, right? And yelling at people and calling them names is not the way to persuade people. It's thoughtfulness, uh, it's, it's recognizing what they might think originally and trying to move them, and this is what we need to teach people to do. Um, so I feel pretty good about the, and I hate the word safe space, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a fan of the concept as I think it's sometimes described, but a classroom needs to be a place where people feel personally respected and free to think what they want to think and explore ideas, and there should be no name calling, uh, and we should find ways to do that that are respectful and, heaven forbid, even fun. Um, and if we do that well, then I think a lot of these issues melt away because we continue to be committed as we have to be to free expression and to uh, critical uh, examination of ideas because without that, what are we doing to begin with? Robin, a last hopeful word. <laughs> Judge, that was a tough question. Okay, so yeah, it may be a movement. This is a problem of elites. Our whole culture is captured by elites. And you know, the point about our students is they don't buy into that movement by and large. They just want to be respectful of each other and they actually found ways to do that. We should hand over the keys to them, uh, bottle whatever their insights are and send it to the rest of the world. At some point, we have to drown out the elites. And that's a relentless process to use the Dean's word. And I think it's one that we just have to stay vigilant about and actually be part of, lift these guys' voices up because they are tomorrow's leaders and they don't buy into all of this fracturing. Well, thanks to all of our speakers. Please join me in welcoming, thanking them.